Look, I'm aware that a better YouTuber would save it for Halloween, but a better person wouldn't be a YouTuber, so all is fair in love, war, and seasonal content. Actually, it was a different holiday that led us here because every year when my family sits down to dye Easter eggs, I dream big about designing a themed collection, and this year my victims were Velma, Shaggy, Scooby, Fred, and Daphne. They're abstract, okay? Despite my aspirations, I'm not an egg artist. They were good for one thing, though, which was getting me thinking about Scooby-Doo being one of my only beloved childhood properties that I'd yet to revisit as an adult, and I love revisiting my childhood properties as an adult. So I did. I spent the following week re-watching all of Jim Stenstrom's direct-to-video Scooby-Doo movies as well as the live-action theatrically released pair because, to be clear, before now those films shaped the bulk of my Scooby-Doo exposure, along with a healthy dose of what's new Scooby-Doo. <laughs> I had such a marvelous time reminiscing that I kind of married myself to the idea of ranking every Scooby-Doo movie before I realized how many more there are than I was raised on. 46 to be exact, including telefilms, discluding shorts, all of which I've now seen. And as fun as it's been, refraining from enjoying anything else in order to become the expert I am today, I'm so excited to get this video out and watch something for adults. like. Fifty Shades Darker or Schindler's List. I don't want to do much disclaiming, you know, subjectivity and all that. Spoilers, I guess. I certainly tried to fight my nostalgia bias, but it does not show. I mean, I don't know what you want me to do lie. My favorites are my favorites. I did organize my placements into what I'd consider to be more impartial tiers. One out of three Scooby Snacks, two out of three Scooby Snacks, and three out of three Scooby Snacks. The good, the bad, and the other. It's still debatable though. I've found opinions very wildly. I also had my patrons choose their favorites, and I agree with their top five at least, which is probably partly due to most of my viewers being around my same age, but I choose to believe we're just correct. I'll let you in on their top five as they appear but they won't appear until my top six. So the vast majority of Scooby-Doo movies are direct-to-video post-Zombie Island releases, but a select few are Scrappy-Doo era telefilms released in the 80s as part of the Superstars 10 anthology. All of these have wound up in the bottom tier. If you have fond memories of them, no offense, but be sure to rewatch them before you dare disagree with me because they're chores to watch. I understand that it's not an unpopular opinion to dislike Scrappy-Doo, but I hate the guy. I can hear the pro Scrappy counterculture now saying he's innocent, he didn't do anything wrong, but what you fail to realize is that I don't hate him for being a bad dog. I hate him for existing. I feel like the point of baby versions of iconic characters is that they're cute, as seen on a pup named Scooby-Doo, but Scrappy is well, hideous. He's got a bulbous, disproportionate head, and he walks on his hind legs 24-7, the psycho. Appearances aside, he doesn't exist in addition to the Scooby gang. He replaces them. The straight man to red shirt Shaggy and Scooby's funny man. You see, Scrappy's personality isn't what's off-putting about him. His presence merely signals the absence of what makes Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo, Mystery Incorporated. I'm not a stickler for the formula. I quite like when it's cleverly subverted, but Scooby-Doo without mystery is a meandering, plotless bore. Scooby-Doo meets the Boo Brothers specifically, follows Shaggy inheriting his confederate ghost uncle's haunted house and hiring shameless ripoffs of Casper's ghostly trio to help him ghost bust the situation. There's also some man, his annoying sister, and wild animals running around for no apparent reason. I'd rather die than watch it again. <laughs> explain the premise of Scooby-Doo and the Reluctant Werewolf to you and it's going to sound awesome, but believe you me, it's not. Basically, Red Shirt Shaggy is a race car driver, you're just gonna have to accept that one, and upon turning into a werewolf, Dracula agrees to turn him back if he wins the Monster Road Rally held in Transylvania. It's a shame that such a hilarious concept was wasted on this era of uninteresting Hanna-Barbera animation. I understand that critiques of the bland, repetitive animation style can be lobbed at some of the old school shows as well, but I'm not ranking those, and there is a difference between sitting through a half hour and an hour and a half of it. These telefilms are the longest, non-theatrically released movies of the bunch. They have no right to be 
And have I mentioned Googie? Googie is Shaggy's one-time girlfriend introduced by a narrator 20 seconds into The Reluctant Werewolf as adoring but liberated. And cheered on by his adoring but liberated girlfriend, Googie. Go, Shaggy, go! Adoring but liberated? What does that even mean? A feminist housewife? Should I change my Tinder bio? I will say that Dracula's voice actor gave it his all. They won't! Not if Shaggy wants me to turn him back to, ugh, normal. Besides, this is a wonderful chance. The third superstar's 10 entry managed to place a wee bit higher. So for now, what was originally called Arabian Nights rebranded as Scooby-Doo in Arabian Nights. This is essentially a misbranded Hanna-Barbera retelling of 1001 Nights, aka gender-swapped Alia Dean, starring Yogi Bear as Genie, and Sinbad starring Megilla Gorilla as Sinbad. I'll let you process that for a moment. <laughs> Yeah, that was one long hibernation. Scooby and Shaggy are briefly present as storytellers, a la The Princess Bride, but this is definitely not a real movie, let alone a Scooby-Doo movie. I feel bad having to rank it against them, but to be fair, it's not like I had a good time regardless. If I wanted to watch Aladdin or Sinbad, I would. I mean, anyone in their right mind who has watched Arabian Nights this century has done so on a Scooby-Doo binge, so all of the letterbox reviews are just like, what the hell is this? <laughs> Like Arabian Nights, the mystery map ranks lowly for not being a real movie. They're puppets, which I'd find cute if I didn't find them cursed. Mom, can you pick me up? I'm scared. I'm glad they tried it once, but it's ultimately unsettling. I would much rather not see them as puppets ever again. It also contributes to the feeling that this one was made for babies, like all Scooby-Doo media has a family-friendly demographic in mind, but this one is particularly juvenile. And while there is a mystery, it deals with finding treasure as opposed to unmasking a monster. Not my Scooby-Doo. Scooby-Doo! Scooby Goes Hollywood was the first Scooby-Doo movie ever, and like its aforementioned successors, it's not loyal to any aspect of the formula. It's actually kind of meta. Like Scooby and Shaggy, actors decide that they deserve primetime roles and spend the runtime pitching themselves as characters in iconic 70s television. Ultimately, they decide not to leave their Saturday morning cartoon because the people of Hollywood do believe in fairies. They do. <laughs> totally disjointed and boring, but it is a bit of a musical and the numbers do go hard. We're coming through! The name to remember is Scooby-Doo! Scooby-Doo! Nice! Just a Ruby-Doo guy! A Ruby-Doo, Scooby-Doo, be you, be cool guy! I gotta have some time to make my mind up! Love you, Scooby-Doo! Gotta be sure I like what I can see! <laughs> You know, before this little Scooby-Doo excursion, I wasn't aware of a second live action pair, and I could have lived without becoming aware. <laughs> I probably shouldn't get into what I think works about the good live action movies yet, but it comes down to effective, intentional camp. Those movies were committed to being real life cartoons in a way these movies didn't try to be or didn't have the budget to be. People like to rag on the cast, but whether or not they should have put him in a blonde wig, I think Robbie Amell does have Fred energy. I like Hayley Kiyoko as Velma. The other two are fine. It's not their fault they were saddled with a script written by the same guys who wrote Norm of the North. I referred to The Mystery Begins as Scooby-Doo meets Fred the movie on Letterboxd, and I stand by that, down to the sardine humor. Care for a bite? What is that? It's a PBJ and S. Peanut butter jelly and oh. sardines. Oh, okay. It's a Mystery Inc. origin story. As far as movies go, there are only two of those. I don't like either, but this one's worse because it's a poorly done Breakfast Club homage, which is made even more embarrassing by one of its actors taking part in a slightly better Breakfast Club homage a couple of years later. It's still better than its sequel, though, in which Shaggy has a crush on Velma. The two go on a date, 
kiss and while they don't end up together i was legitimately worried they would they kept the jig up for far too long and took it way too seriously i mean i was fully yelling at my laptop my mom asked what was wrong from the other room i've since learned that the pairing was also explored in 2010's mystery incorporated i checked out a couple of their scenes from that show and found them all absolutely nauseating as well though according to one of that show's producers the atrociousness of the couple was intentional because velma was a canonical lesbian. That's all well and good, but I don't feel like giving them kudos considering it was still left technically textually ambiguous. The story is that they didn't have enough time to pair her with her intended, but they did have three years, two seasons, and 52 episodes, didn't they? And we don't have to show for it a real lesbian romance, but we do have decades worth of movies just insisting Velma's attracted to men. But you like Thundar. I like Thundar's abs, okay? I watch it for the abs. Me too. It does feel like a lie, doesn't it? Her only love interest I buy she'd be into is Bo, because I can't imagine somebody not being into Bo. Anyway, what I'm getting at is that the least Curse of the Lake monster could have done would have been allowing Haley Kyoko's of all people's version of her to be gay. Though I suppose this duology's clunky exploration of Shaggy and Velma isn't as bad as its suggestion that Velma's in tough for red. It would be kind of nice to have someone to escort me to the chess club socials. <laughs> That's a spirit. What about Fred? He's pretty cute, right? Do you think he would- Ouch! Goob is the other Mystery Inc. origin story, at least for like 10 minutes before it time jumps into a superhero flick for some reason. A while back, a few promotional clips of this movie made the rounds on Twitter, and everyone was particularly mad about its portrayal of Scooby being named after Scooby Snacks, when in fact his canon name is Scooberts. I wasn't on board with the bandwagon because I don't think Scooby-Doo is the property to get caught up on the lore of. I don't even think it's fair to say there is a Scooby-Doo canon. I mean, just in the movies, Scooby's been shown to have been picked out by the whole gang at a pet store to have bounded through Shaggy's window one night and here to have met him at the beach. The branding of Scooby Snacks isn't even consistent. I just chose the easiest one to paint and I did a bad job still, but I still think it's cute. Like, I think I'll put snacks in here. Also, I bought like this like says, well, actually, my mom bought them. It says Scooby on it. These are like real Scooby snacks, but I don't know why they don't sell Scooby snacks in the boxes like from the movies or the shows. Like they sell them in like fully branded boxes with Scooby's face on them. Maybe that is better, but no, no, it's not. This would be so cool to sell in the store with like circle ones, like in any of the any of the shows. You could have the different kinds of boxes because there's so many different kinds of boxes. Anyway, if anything, my disagreement with those viral complaints left me hoping to like Scoob. I mean, as far as my contrarian tendencies go, I prefer liking things everyone hates to hating things everyone likes, so I was on Scoob's side. Unfortunately, I hated it. If I had to describe it in one word, it would be corporate or soulless. Two words then. It's corporate and soulless. I mean, it's hardly a Scooby-Doo movie as much as a Hanna-Barbera Cinematic Universe launching pad, hence the prevalence of the Blue Falcon. We've known and loved these characters in 2D animation, which was abandoned, as well as the decades active voice cast. Gone is a soundtrack full of never before heard chase sequence music and Arrived has top 40 radio. <laughs> character dabs simon cowell has two unnecessary cameos and when you interpret the movie through all of that context decisions like ignoring scooby's previously established name don't come off like intentional creative diversions as much as feel emblematic of a movie uninterested in engaging with the legacy it's profiting off of i've only ranked it above the aforementioned garbage because it's more technically competent. Like, I'm fully aware that much of my hatred for it doesn't stem from its independent quality, but I also don't feel bad refusing to review it in a vacuum because it's using the Scooby-Doo name. Anyway, I can't fail to mention the worst thing it does, which is to Daphne. Full disclosure, Daphne's my favorite Scooby-Doo character, Blair's my favorite Gossip Girl character, Lydia's my favorite Teen Wolf character, Summer's my favorite OC character. What can I say? Gaslight, gatekeep, girl boss. But Scooby-Doo at large has been at war with Daphne 
for quite some time, and by this I mean that she was written in the 60s as a damsel in distress, the beauty to Fred's brawn and Velma's brain. But because feminism, they're always trying to find new angles for her, which are never consistent. Now I happen to love some of her ditzy iterations and some of her empowered iterations. What I will not stand for is Scoob's insistence that her divine purpose is being an empath. Fred, you're the tank, the muscle. Cool. Daphne is the people person, the empath. Aww. Tank, empath, brain. <laughs> I finally figured out what you guys are. You're the heart. I have a long-standing feud with the concept of empaths, and I won't get into it, but I just think that we shouldn't be co-opting the fundamental human experience of empathy into our special things. And while I don't think the writers meant to instill Daphne with that much baggage by referring to her as an empath twice, they definitely did mean to establish her as the one who cares, which is just too Elena Gilbert for my tastes. Thank you for hearing me out. <laughs> and Velma is the only Scooby-Doo movie which doesn't feature Scooby-Doo, and it's another live-action version I wasn't aware of before now. However, if the previously mentioned pair were Fred the movie, aka Nick, this one is How to Build a Better Boy, aka Disney Channel. I mean that so literally, this is that era of decomp to me. Where live-action Scooby-Doo with Nick energy ripped off Velma's Monsters Unleashed makeover, live-action Scooby-Doo with Disney energy rips off Scooby-Doo the movie's mass hypnosis plot. They both simply pale in comparison to the good live-action take on the property. This one mainly places higher because it's more aesthetically pleasing, but I don't know, it's still weird. I don't get why this Daphne and Velma specific origin story isn't even about them meeting. They're established as as virtual best friends immediately and squandered is any opportunity to tell an interesting story about polar opposites becoming unlikely friends. I would like that. Finally, we can address the best Superstars 10 candidates. Keep in mind, being the best of the worst isn't the same as being good, but I feel I must tread lightly with this one because despite nobody picking it as their ultimate favorite, I did get a couple of replies from patrons about their love for Ghoul School, and to be fair, there's a reason it places so much higher than The Reluctant Werewolf and Boo Brothers. The reason is simple. Its side characters are absolute icons. What's wrong with that? I'm Sabella, Count Dracula's daughter. the werewolf to be exact. Hello! Why, goodbye! <laughs> Hi, I'm Elsa Frankentine. And I'm out of here. The short version is that Red Shirt Shaggy gets a job at an all-girls school for ghouls, and that premise alone carries it because that is fun. The actual goings-on, however, are as overlong and aimless as this era's other entries. Most of it is about them trying to win a sports game against their neighboring human boy school. A real villain doesn't show up until halfway through Revolta, but she's hardly compelling. And I haven't even mentioned Scrappy's rap. So with the cadets, it was a snap to escape Revolta's trap. Now let's get loose and dance and clap while I lay on my Scrappy rap. Jail time, like maybe the prison industrial complex made a point. Obviously, we haven't yet reached its placement, so here's hoping you lot are aware of the first ever direct-to-video Scooby-Doo movie released in 1998, Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island. It's the one with the cat girls. I wasn't inherently opposed to the idea of a sequel, especially considering my marathon was chronological and the movie that came out just before this one was a cute little continuation of an 80s show, The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo. However, despite not being a particularly bad movie, Return to Zombie Island is a particularly bad sequel. Might I remind you, the iconic thing about Zombie Island was that it was the first time Scooby-Doo monsters were real and a real threat. Like, the Scrappy-Doo days featured ghouls and goblins in a fun way, but um, Zombie Island to this day is the best this franchise has ever been at 
horror. And better yet, it has the perfect ending in which evidence of their supernatural experience is lost to quicksand. Of course, movies have been released since that don't align with the narrative that the Scooby gang is well aware of the paranormal, but that's okay because like I said, there is no one Scooby-Doo canon. The Scooby-Doo name is nothing but a formula for creative crews to subvert or embrace however they see fit. The same can't be said for Scooby-Doo films that overtly share continuity, which is why Return to Zombie Island rubs me the wrong way when it decides Velma's convinced herself their zombie island adventure was nothing but a swamp gas-fueled hallucination. Unsolved? But the cat people from last time... Must be the same people looking for the treasure this time. And the original zombies? Swamp gas. Is it in character? Maybe, according to a rather shallow read of Velma being a skeptic for the sake of it, but it's certainly not a choice cognizant of the virtues of Zombie Island. I should clarify, this movie doesn't suggest its predecessor's events weren't real. There is an actual cat person running around. The problem is the gang doesn't interact with it, catch it, nor defeat it. This is nothing more than your average unmasking, which wouldn't be the worst thing if it weren't taking place within the hollowed cat girl caves of Moonscar Island. It's not a bad time, it's just that nothing about it would change if it took place elsewhere. If you told me this was a completely unrelated project shoehorned into becoming a Zombie Island sequel, I would believe you. Nobody even speaks with a mysterious Louisiana accent. Sorry, I couldn't help it over here. I work as a chef in a house on Moon Sky Island, a house that really is haunted. all of this, I never would have guessed Scooby-Doo collaborated with the WWE once, let alone twice. It turns out they've collaborated with a number of bizarre celebrities and brands. This is the gang. Gang? This is my uncle. Bobby Flay. This tradition dates back to an entire series of which every episode featured guest stars. You might think that justifies the Simon Cowell cameo, but that was different. It's not the same thing, a gimmicky cameo and Bobby Flay being Fred's uncle, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The overarching quality of these collaborative efforts do waver. I find the campier they are, the better, and much to my dismay, these two are tasteful. I mean, it's acknowledged in the first one that the whole point of wrestling is putting on a flamboyant show. I don't see anything in the rules about the use of furniture. It's a show, Velma. So then why am I having such a normal time? You'd think the wrestling sequences would be animated like, I don't know, Powerpuff Girl fights? Not to reference the Fred movie twice in one video, or ever, really, but I assumed John Cena would show up like he did in It, a sociopath. Instead, he's a regularly regular guy. John Cena! Whoa! Okay. At the end of the day, I ranked WrestleMania Mystery above Curse of the Speed Demon because the latter is structurally what you'd expect from this crossover, as in wrestling happens. Its follow-up is a race flick, which I didn't desire another of after The Reluctant Werewolf and didn't anticipate from a WWE collaboration because I didn't know the WWE did races. Was NASCAR busy? I thought they were the only race people. Hollywood! Hit the road and hit the town. You know, I'm not super opposed to the Scooby gang being depicted as Legos, but I am super opposed to Haunted Hollywood's chosen themes being paired with the limiting Lego animation style. Let me explain. This thing could be called a horror love letter. It's about a movie studio known for horror having to make romantic comedies to stay afloat and all of their iconic monsters coming to life. Now, setting aside the fact that as of 2016 when this was released and to this day, horror is a much more theatrically profitable genre than romance and produced much more frequently, I don't think that a Scooby-Doo movie with a pro-horror agenda is a bad idea. It's kind of the children's horror property, like It and Goosebumps. Fun fact, it wasn't picked up upon first pitch because it was too scary. It boasts an iconic catalog of monsters of its own, yet all Haunted Hollywood has to show for it is default Lego mummy and default Lego zombie. They're incapable of inspiring fear, let alone mere fascination. I simply think a horror love letter should be horrific. <laughs> me if 
I don't have much to say about this tier's entries. It's just that most of them have wound up here because they're average, and when you're ranking this many movies, you have to cut corners somewhere. Abracadabra do in particular, I find to be the most forgettable of the whole bunch. In fact, the only thing I feel like I remember about it is that Velma's sister and Shaggy had a thing, which was too similar to Velma and Shaggy having a thing for me. I mean, we have to boycott the idea. <laughs> This one mainly just felt like a shallow depiction of Japan, down to the music. Everybody's doing the Like, both of those songs were written and performed by these two people, so you tell me. It's as if they couldn't decide between respectfully depicting the traditional Japanese countryside or modern Tokyo, so they just threw stereotypes at the wall. It's unfortunate because I was actually kind of looking forward to the samurai sword after catching a glimpse of the dragon in it. I mean, the green dragon is still the best thing about it, but it's only present for like half a second. Besides that, my most noteworthy opinion is that this is my second least favorite depiction of Daphne. Sometimes the make Daphne a role model strategy consists of writing her with never before mentioned hobbies. Here she's inexplicably been invited to compete in a prestigious martial arts tournament. She's generally skilled in combat sometimes, which I can accept, but it's harder to convince me she's one of karate's world's best. I'm so honored to be invited to the tournament. And so should you be. Miss Miramoto runs the most exclusive martial arts academy in all the world. Understand that this critique doesn't come from me thinking she's a Mary Sue or whatever the misogynists are saying these days. Quite the opposite. I don't think that well-intentioned writers should have to justify girly characters existing by providing them impressive skills. With the sound of the surf gently breaking Speaking of, Aloha Scooby-Doo presents one of my favorite empowered versions of Daphne. Manu said she was just north of here. But which way is north? Easy. Uh, Daphne? What are you doing? I'm checking my hair. You're always checking your hair? No, silly. I'm seeing which way it blows. That means north is that way. Mm. I just think it's a logical progression to make her the street smart to Velma's book smart, and she makes a better fashion designer than karate black belt recipient. However, much like the samurai sword, Aloha suffers from what we'll call cultural insensitivity. It's funny because I wouldn't venture to say this perception is usually intended, but the meddling kids are kinda anti-capitalist icons, like they're typically busting greedy businessmen fear-mongering for profit. This one takes a different approach, and by that I mean that the literal gentrifiers running around wind up being victims of Manu, an indigenous Hawaiian, sent to jail and stripped of his native title, which is then given to a dog. At least I'm still the big kahuna of Hanahuna. No one can take that away from me. Not so fast, Manu. I am proud to announce that this year's trophy for the Big Kahuna of Hanahuna Surfing Contest goes to... Scooby-Doo. It's a good day for politicians and realtors. If you ever have a hankering for some beachfront property, here's my card. Look me up. Thanks, Mr. LaLuna, we will. Monster of Mexico gets points for introducing me to my favorite recurring Fred joke, which is him being an extremely American tourist. E muy deliciosas cometas. It loses points for having an unnecessary sad ending in which one of the villains is this man's fiance who just like secretly despises him. Charlene, I thought you loved me. Oh, would you wake up and smell the Cafe Lechera, you pea brain romantic! Poor guy. Step right this way, it's finally the day. The circus comes to town. I wasn't able to find a good, totally legal download of Big Top, so you'll just have to take my word for it, but this one features a 
Troy Bolton and High School Musical Season 2 subplot in which Shaggy acquires a little bit of fame for his circus act. They've temporarily joined the circus, by the way, and he lets it get to his head, starts treating Scooby poorly. I wouldn't go so far as to call it impossible to pull off, but I've yet to be impressed by an attempt at conflict between Shaggy and Scooby. It's even my least favorite thing about Scooby-Doo the movie, which I've obviously placed quite highly. Their relationship is just so well established that any attempt at complicating it reads as out of character. They're really quite easy to get right. Nobody who's into Scooby-Doo is tired of seeing them get along. Aside from that, this one has its moments, I guess. I quite like these clowns. The ending is more complicated than your average unmasking, which I usually appreciate. Scooby transforms into a human briefly, and I find him cursed in a good way. a much better, if still ultimately average, crossover between Scooby-Doo and the Blue Falcon than Scoob made extra juicy in hindsight because even though it was released years and years prior, it kind of works as a Scoob commentary. I don't know guys, hmm. that old Blue Falcon TV show was pretty campy, but I gotta say, I'm really looking forward to the screening of the new, updated, darker, edgier Blue Falcon movie featuring mega movie star Brad Adams. I mean, darker and edgier aren't necessarily applicable, but the rest totally is. Let us pray the CW never gets the rights to Scooby-Doo. first third or so of Pirates Ahoy is fun because it follows the gang going on a mystery cruise, basically like an extended escape room type thing, and they solve everything immediately, ruining the fun for everyone else. I don't know what we're gonna do now. You've totally blown my schedule, and we've gone through a week's worth of mysteries in two days. <gasps> Sorry. I just think that's funny. <laughs> then though, when the actual plot gets started, it's a little bit off the wall. I don't tend to scrutinize the villain's plans in these things because who cares? But this villain's plan is really something. Biff Wellington, of course. He was after the meteor all this time. But why go to all that trouble for a meteor? The meteor would give me the power to control the triangle and time travel. Mr. Wellington, where on earth did you get such a crazy idea? Mr. Mysterio? I convinced him that he was the reincarnation of a famous pirate. You mean I'm not? But why do you want the meteor so badly? It's solid gold. I can't believe that everyone on the ship was involved in the conspiracy. Wooden Leg Wally, a.k.a. Mr. Mysterio, hypnotized everyone on the ship to think they were pirates. <laughs> The highlight of my entire marathon was finding out Bobby Flay was Fred's uncle. I don't know why I derived so much more delight from Bobby Flay's appearance than other celebrities. I guess I just know Bobby Flay in a way I don't know John Cena. Against my will, by the way, my family loves the Food Network. At the same time, I do think WrestleMania Mystery is comparable to the Gourmet Ghost because neither of them have enough fun for what they are. I'm just more lenient with this one because the WWE is a campy brand, but the Food Network is very milk toast, so it's fitting at least. This one is more in line with what I'd want from a Lego Scooby-Doo movie. It's just a fun little musical. I love a Scooby-Doo musical, apparently. And snap your fingers to that crazy beat. We are happy Oh, right. I'm still not convinced this partnership brings out the best in Scooby-Doo, though. <laughs> I'd probably like this one better if I were bigger on Batman. I mean, I quite like the Dark Knight trilogy, but unless you count Joker or Suicide Squad, that's all of the Batman content I've consumed in my time on this earth. When I read positive reviews of The Brave and the Bold, it seemed like people were really excited about how much of the Batman universe made it in, including a climactic scene in which the Scooby gang dresses like his previous sidekicks. This is considered a real crossover in a way most Scooby-Doo collaborations aren't, but endless callbacks to previous Batman content just isn't as satisfying for me, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Hex Girls are 
are here underutilized but here and truthfully their reappearance is what placed the legend of the vampire this highly outside of them it's as boring as the post stenstrom pre matthew lillard entries tend to be i guess velma sings in it and i also like that <laughs> Like the Brave and the Bold, I'm under the impression that other people are more into this one than I am, but perhaps for the opposite reason. I'm not big on Batman, but I am big on Young Frankenstein. Franken and Creepy isn't a retelling of Young Frankenstein or anything, but it is occasionally considered something like Scooby-Doo's take on it, so I suppose I kept thinking I could watch that instead. We're past halfway through this ranking though, so I have placed Franken and Creepy within the upper echelon of the middle. This because it and the other two be mentioned Scooby-Doo movie directed by its same director have a shared strength, which is aesthetic integrity. Stylistically, they're swinging for the fences, which I so appreciate about them. Unfortunately, they also share a weakness, in my opinion, which is that it's more noticeable than usual that Daphne and Velma were written by men, mostly in that they're kind of at each other's throats. <laughs> Didn't you mention that you wanted to do an exclusive expose on someone in the mystery solving game? That someone being me? Oh, I forgot. You're the expert now. Are you still mad at me because I scored higher than you on the test and have better hair? I'm hideous! <laughs> no, don't turn away. Look at yourself. You're beautiful. Really? No. In fairness, Velma's been hypnotized to be maddened by science in this one, so she's not particularly kind to anyone. I'm sorry I tried to take your brains, guys. I think I was hypnotized by a device disguised to look like an antique Strickvaden electro wheel. Uh, that's okay. Yeah, Velma. Like that could happen to anybody. It just doesn't sit right with me that they specifically mock each other's appearances two movies in a row. Which brings me to the worst thing about Frank and Creepy, which is Daphne being a walking fat joke in it because of a magical dress, don't worry about it. First of all, it's not good for her character, reducing her to being looks obsessed. Each of you will lose what you hold most dear. Is that why I've lost my looks? We haven't reached them yet, but there are actually a couple of vapid versions of Daphne I do enjoy. Like if a himbo is a male bimbo and the general public loves a good himbo, then there's nothing inherently wrong with writing a lovable ditz, see Karen Smith, but some of these attempts are going to feel more mean-spirited than others. I got a mean-spirited vibe from this one, probably because second of all, this subplot is inherently fat phobic. There's this scene thrown in there about Fred thinking she's pretty anyway, and it's like, yay, I guess that makes up for a temporarily fat, usually skinny character being terrified of her own reflection for half of your runtime movie. Thanks. Anyway, most movies I've awarded two out of three Scooby Snacks are average, but I really do see the appeal of this one. If it didn't bother me in ways it probably doesn't bother other people, I might also consider it one of Scooby-Doo's best. So to end on a positive note, Fred mourning the mystery machine is one of my favorite bits from this entire series. I'm useless as a mystery solver and as a man. <laughs> room. Room. Look at her go. Gone. <laughs> So this is the most recent Scooby-Doo movie and it's cute. I don't have any gripes with it. I'm actually happy with most of what they've done recently aside from Scoob and Return to Zombie Island. They've landed on a bit of a self-aware streak and they're having fun with it. He was convinced you were here to lay claim to the town. Like I don't wanna own real estate. You don't? Man, no way. Do you know how many creepy evil people we've met that do weird things just for a piece of land? Early on in The Sword and the Scoob, it appears the gang has time traveled into ancient Camelot, but the twist is that an entire town has just conspired to convince them they've time traveled into ancient Camelot for real estate reasons. It really is funny how much of this series is contingent upon land ownership. This one and the next few only miss out on the top tier, which we're rapidly approaching because I don't consider them standouts necessarily. <laughs> What I appreciate most here is definitely that the culprit is just this girl trying to get her crush, the host of a little known radio show about the Yeti to stay in town by pretending to be the abominable snowman. All I really wanted was to listen to Del Chillman on the radio. You see, 
I am your number one fan. Really? So like that's why she's trying so hard to scare us all. She just wanted to convince Dale to stick around. I just get a kick out of that. Isn't it cute? A little romance. Totally reasonable behavior. I much prefer Shaggy's ancestors being cowboys to confederates, but then again, the sword in the scoop suggests he's a descendant of King Arthur's successor, so I guess there are two sides to everybody's genealogy. These movies tend to come up with new family history for the Scooby gang whenever it's convenient anyway. Like, Daphne is Scottish because we're doing a movie about the Loch Ness Monster and she has red hair. Sure. Anyway, yeah, I think I'm a horse girl. I just like that this one is about cowboys and isn't that enough? Plus Velma has this recurring bit about fonts and it amuses me. Oh no. What? This is terrible. Look at this. They used El Cabong font. The whole website is El Cabong. And you used El Cabong font. No professional would use that font. No one with any taste or self-respect would- Easy there, Velma. I saw the font again on the Black Rattler management business card we found. There can't possibly be two people in the world who would use that font. I mean, look at it! The moral of this story is, never use El Cabong! <laughs> last we have arrived, and might I point out that 17 out of 46 top tier movies is not bad at all. That's almost 40%. Of course, these are just my opinions, but we must remember that I am always right. Anyway, The Legend of the Phantasaur features phantom dinosaurs. Hello? As if that's not all I need to say to convince you it's a great time, know that it's also one of the funniest movies this series has to offer. I'm failing science. Mr. Fleischer didn't like my project. Why? It illustrates all three of Newton's laws of motion. <laughs> Didn't the doctor forbid Shaggy to get into this van? He told him not to get into the mystery machine. That's why I repaid it. The mustard machine? A motorcycle race. Well, that's not so terrible. Do you know how to ride a motorcycle? No idea. <laughs> it's terrible. I don't have much interesting to say about it. It's just a remarkably, wonderfully weird time and the only good race movie. Not just out of Scooby-Doo race movies. Of all race movies. <laughs> mentioned it, but Happy Halloween, Return to Zombie Island, and the movie ranked just above this one, which is the continuation of The 13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, half-heartedly share a continuity. There's basically this sheriff that wants Mystery Inc. to disband because it's his job to crime solve or whatever, and while I'm glad they tried it, I think I do prefer Scooby-Doo movies being independent outside of the odd sequel. Still, the storyline doesn't stand to ruin any of the three. I mean, Return to Zombie Island has its own problems, but you know. I only bring it up because Happy Halloween essentially does away with the sheriff by making him the culprit, which I find hilarious. I'll take the big reveal from here, Velma. Reveal? Who's that? Who's that? Who's that? Like Who is that? So I did what anyone in my situation would do. I spent my remaining millions to amass an army of drones and moved to Crystal Cove to impersonate a local sheriff. Other reasons I love this movie include Bill Nye being the Mystery Machine's Alexa for no apparent reason. Do you have any science-based wisdom to impart? Well, Velma, if you stacked every ruler on Earth end to end between the Earth and the Moon, they would all drift away before you could measure anything at all. Okay, yeah, I mean science wisdom that applies to our current situation. Oh, uh, well, no. Then. And it confirming my suspicions that Fred is a himbo. I'm gonna do what I do best. I'm gonna do traps. Like, I think the generally agreed upon rubric for a himbo is that he must be a dumb hunk who respects women. Now, Fred is obviously dumb and respects women, but it's hotly debated whether or not he is a hunk. It needn't be any more. Happy Halloween has answered the question. The 13th ghost of Scooby Doo. <laughs> so I've done a little bit of looking into what the 13 ghosts of Scooby Doo was and 
it seems wild. Like Scrappy-Doo era, except Daphne is there and some kid named Flim Flam. And while the entire short-lived series followed this gang trying to catch 13 ghosts and put them in a box, it was canceled before its 13th episode, meaning they only cut 12. This movie serves as that show's conclusion. And what do you know? It's cute. I went into it completely blind and just had a good time. Like, woo, Flim Flam. Who's Flim Flam? It's fun that because of their absence in the show, Fred and Velma are just along for the ride here while Daphne gets a whole new look and a whole new car. This is definitely my favorite girl bossified version of her. I also love that even though Velma doesn't believe there are real monsters in the box, she refrains from opening it just in case. Okay, fine. I'll prove to you that ghosts are just stories. The real chest of demons. <laughs> What are you Stop. doing? Are you nuts? Yeah, I mean, what if you're wrong? Ugh, fine. What? Nothing. It's so emblematic of this entire title's complicated relationship with the reality of the paranormal or lack thereof. My letterboxed review for this one was target demographic reached, but that was kind of a bald-faced lie. <laughs> I just thought it would be funny, which it apparently wasn't. That's one of my least liked letterboxed reviews. It's as if all you have to do is look at me to know I don't know a thing about Kiss. To the point where when their iconic songs were playing in the movie, I was like, that's Kiss? I wish you'd all come to your senses. You don't see me acting ridiculous over my favorite group, the Ascot Five, do you? Oh no, no. don't tug my Ascot. Don't pull my ass out. Gone. No, baby. My lack of knowledge didn't stop me from enjoying the thing though, because this is exactly what a weird collaboration like it should be. I mean, what better way to incorporate Kiss into your Scooby-Doo story than to make them a rival mystery solving gang with magic powers. <laughs> Full disclosure, it was all a dream and their powers aren't real, but it's not about the destination, it's about the journey and I had a marvelous time. So this is the other movie directed by the same director of Frank and Creepy, which depicts Daphne and Velma as trying to one-up each other the whole time. That's the worst thing about it, but aside from that, it's amazing, show-stopping, a wonderful time. There's just so much going on stylistically. Like, we're in space, the villain is a hottie with great hair, and the alien? It's so well designed. It strikes fear into my heart. There's even a whole sequence in the end that shows every character imagining themselves as the hero in a different art style. It's awesome. Very much adequate. The Loch Ness Monster was the only animated Scooby-Doo movie that I watched as a part of my original Easter binge that wasn't directed by Jim Stenstrom. I guess it's just an outlier that I was also super into as a kid, most likely because the Young Dubliners are featured on its soundtrack and my family is into the band. They were my first concert. Speaking of, this movie's soundtrack and chase sequences carry it. Castles may stand, but they don't last forever. Hang on to your friends and you'll get to whatever. Soon you'll be coming out. This is one of my favorites for Scooby and Shaggy specifically. I find them hilarious here. You are in great danger, sir. You, you can't just ignore this. We could try. Shaggy and Scooby, can you guys hear me? Shaggy here. Who's calling? It's Velma. Now listen, you're right on top of it. Hey, Scoob, Velma says we're right on top of things. You take the high road and I'll take the rocky road. Like rocky road ice cream, that is. It's placed a little bit lower than my other childhood favorites, probably just because the plot outside of Scooby and Shaggy's shenanigans is a wee bit boring. Respect must be put on its ending though, which doesn't deny the existence of the Loch Ness Monster. Chill Out doesn't do that with the Yeti either, which I think is important. That's how they should have handled real life legends. <laughs> King is a strange case, actually. I was convinced throughout the first, like, 
third that I hated it, but it slowly wore me down until I loved it. Like it's probably the exception to the Superstars 10 rule and that it's not focused on mystery or anything really, but I love it anyway. Scooby and Shaggy just stumble into various Halloween themed situations and it's a fun time. Despite Happy Halloween existing, I'd consider this Scooby-Doo's quintessential Halloween movie. It captures an inherent nostalgia by being kind of derivative of everything I've ever seen. <laughs> like, I don't know, Tinkerbell, she's here. Those gargoyles from The Hunchback, make them goblins. I have a dream from Tangled, bet on it. Or it might be more like, this is Halloween. Be out of sight. This one's also a musical, by the way. I did not anticipate so many of those, but I am the opposite of complaining about it. I was particularly reminded of Halloween Town pretty often, like they're looking for a scepter because their friends are at risk of being turned into monsters and also skeleton transportation. I suppose in the end, this is a look at what those 80s movies could have been if they weren't super boring. I tried the limousine to line it up on a road. If I would have liked The Brave and the Bold better, were I big on Batman, and I would have liked Frank and Creepy better, were I less big on Young Frankenstein, I think I probably wouldn't love Stage Fright as much if I were big on The Phantom of the Opera. <laughs> Word on the street is that this is Scooby-Doo's Phantom of the Opera, but I didn't have to worry about that because I don't know a thing about Phantom of the Opera unless you count Michael Crawford's picture in Chad's mom's refrigerator. Who's Michael Crawford? He was the Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. Now my mom, she's seen that musical 27 times and she put Michael Crawford's picture in our refrigerator. To me, Stage Fright is more like Daphne and Fred fan fiction, which is only an insult if you're boring. Like they join a singing contest together and Daphne's trying to work up the courage to tell Fred she likes him. More actual romantic plots for them, please. I'm here for it, but don't worry if Velma and Daphne are more your speed, they do stand on a windy balcony at night together. <laughs> it should be noted that the singing competition setup allows for some bangers, such as Homewrecker by this child. <laughs> of the mystery here as well because one of its conclusions shows the phantom in question is just some man who thought he was too ugly to show his face in society because he saw himself in a funhouse mirror. Forced to hide from society to conceal the hideous twisted mass of flesh that is my face. The Phantom of the Opera! Um, you look fine? But look! Gaze upon my foul, deformed visage! I'm hideous! Hideous! <laughs> Dude, this is a funhouse mirror. I mean, I don't have any others, and when I go out, I always wear the mask. Hey! Well, this is embarrassing. Wow. Uh, you can't wish I had the last 40 years back. <laughs> into Where's My Mummy thinking I hadn't seen it, you know, like most of these, but I think it was familiar enough to me that I did at least once. It's not like I remembered much about it though. I was as shocked as anyone to find out the culprit here is Velma trying to stop people from messing with ancient artifacts. <gasps> Velma? As soon as we discovered the hidden chamber, Omar knew that treasure hunters would come from all over. I hope that if we could bring the curse to life, it would scare away the looter. So Velma became Cleopatra, while my workers and I became her army of the undead. I think that's one of the coolest twists on the formula ever, and on top of that, this one is just an epic time. It has a certain grandeur that I love, particularly the third act, which I don't single out to discount the awesomeness of the subplot in which Scooby and Shaggy stumble into a secret society trying to sacrifice them, whose leader is a civil engineer trying to steal the Nile River. Gonna solve a mystery. Camp Rock 2, but make it Scooby-Doo. I mean, perhaps the big camp, little camp trope is bigger than the final jam, but you know, I just think this one is successful at being exactly what it is. I get such ooey gooey summer camp vibes from it. I can't help but love it. It's so cute how all of the monsters are from scary campfire stories, which makes it even more impressive that I do find this to be the scariest Scooby-Doo movie after Zombie Island. There's something to be said about Scooby-Doo actually utilizing 
horror elements, they don't do it nearly frequently enough. I should bring up that Camp Scares Daphne is my favorite vapid version of her because it doesn't feel like the movie hates her for it. This is a bimbo. You hit the nail on the head, beautiful. Oh, I didn't say anything. <laughs> I call entries like The Goblin King, Blowout Beach Bash, or Scooby Goes Hollywood musicals because they each feature at least one full-on musical number, but if you venture to include diegetic musical performances, like half of the movies fit that bill. The Witch's Ghost, The Legend of the Vampire, Shaggy's Showdown, Stage Fright, probably Curse of the Lake Monster, the rock and roll mystery for sure. Music of the Vampire, however, unlike all of the above is a proper, proper musical. <laughs> Need I say more? There's a song about Shaggy and Scooby being pals. Scooby and me, we're gonna be together for good. That buddy of mine, if you're ever in doubt, need me helping you out, you know that I would. There's a song about do 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 <laughs> No demonic beast, There's nothing to see. It's, it's time, time to relax and that's what we're gonna do. do, 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 do. There's a song performed by method acting vampires. On a starlit night, you best all lock your doors up tight, because my friend the vampire start to dance. Actually, the method acting vampires perform a couple of songs. My favorite is the one Bram, the original e-boy, sings to Daphne to seduce her into being kidnapped. Let's live forever and ever, yes never, to sever, together, forever we'll be. You and me. Then, of course, when they're ritualistically marrying her off to the Vampire King, they have to sing a wedding song. Ah, dearly beloved, we're gathered today. I have no notes. This movie is perfect. As promised, we didn't reach my patrons' top five until my top six, but it turns out their third place pick is my sixth. It's actually tied for third place though. You just don't know what else is third yet. It's a mystery. I'd be surprised if it surprised anybody to find out my top six is comprised of the Stenstrom 4 and the live action Two, I can't pretend that nostalgia goggles don't play a role here, but I also can't pretend that I don't genuinely think these are the greatest. Not just because monsters are real in them, but because they all provide a distinct ambiance. Their settings, character designs, and soundtracks just set a mood. Cyber Chase probably the least so because they're hopping through video game levels which differ in aesthetic. I certainly didn't anticipate placing it last in this bunch. It was the first one I watched as part of my initial binge. I remember loving it the most. The virus has always lived rent-free in my mind, and the mere premise of them getting stuck in a video game? Jumanji is shaking. The climax featuring them and their old school digital counterparts together? Where is the Oscar nomination? There's just one thing holding it back, which is a weaker mystery. The baseball stuff has certainly stuck with me, but the reality is that these lab coats aren't around long enough for it to matter one of them is evil. He also has a really weak motive. Bill, you were my best friend. And my best student. But you didn't pick my project. <laughs> That's right, The Witch's Ghost is Patron's first choice. Good for it, I'm happy for it. I should have known I could count on my audience to stand the Hex Girls. I'm gonna cast a spell on you You're gonna do what I want you to I mean, me too, but I suppose the reason why this isn't my first choice is because the third act is a lot more exciting than the rest of it. A little bit of meandering here and there is a small price to pay for how iconic the end game is though. Like how cool is it that the initial mystery is solved halfway through only for Tim Curry to go all warlock on us? We shall reign supreme. Let the evil from the past breathe again with fiery blast. Better yet, the initial mystery's conclusion would have been above average as was. The whole town was in on it. I feel like this is the hot person Scooby-Doo movie. I'm glad it's your favorite actually, because that means cool people watch me. <laughs> I've 
thought long and hard about which of these two I preferred, and the reason why Monsters Unleashed ultimately fell short was because of Velma's romance with that man, because it was ultimately allotted a lot more screen time than her semi-present sub-sub plot with that guy in the first one. The storyline did provide us Leather Velma, thank you, but at what cost? I have other small problems with these, like as I've alluded to, I think Fred is a little bit too douchey. Get your hands off me. Daphne? He planned this somehow, didn't he? I like Isla Fisher and all, but I wish the first one would have foregone Shaggy having a romantic interest and fighting with Scooby about it. I could have also done without the fart sequence, but for the most part, I think these movies are genuinely so hilarious. We got a Mr. Do here. I got a call for a Mr. Do. Uh... Melvin do? You've heard of good movies and movies so bad they're good, but this might be the only movie I can think of that's so bad it's good on purpose. What up, dog? And, uh, dog? Keeping it real. You know, some people would argue that true camp can only be unintentional, but if intentional camp exists, it's this. I've been so pleased to see this pair receiving its flowers on Twitter. It's constantly brought up as the go-to example of how to make a live action version of something. And I agree, they're quite literally walking, breathing cartoons, which might beg the question why they weren't. But in this case, the answer is obviously the cast. I don't wanna live in a world where these actors never played these characters. They're also so quintessentially 2000s, which was the decade I grew up in, so I have a bit of a bias. <laughs> It does sadden me that this is the only member of the Stentrum 4 that didn't make my patrons top 5, but I suppose I can love and cherish it for the lot of us. To be fair, I think you can accuse it of the same flaw the Cyber Chase has, which is a lackluster mystery, but I think that flaw is overshadowed massively by the twist, the twist being that aliens are real and aliens are pretty hippie girls. <laughs> I simply can't express to you the euphoria I experience seeing Amber and Crystal turn into aliens. The ending in which they go back into space forever is like everything to me. Scooby-Doo had any right to make me feel that number of feelings. My dog is whining one second. It's even more impressive that I love these two because I don't particularly like when Shaggy has a love interest, let alone Scooby. There's just the right amount of time dedicated to making their compatibility evident. Another huge part of my attachment to the Alien Invaders is derived from its score. A lot of these movies have banging soundtracks, but this one has a banging score. <laughs> What did you expect? <laughs> Honestly, I find it hard to believe that other people have a different favorite Scooby-Doo movie. Zombie Island, on top of being the best Scooby-Doo movie, is the most influential. It was a series revival, the first time monsters were real, and likely the only reason we have Scooby-Doo movies considering it was the first one that wasn't bad. It was also released the year I was born, which is very important and noteworthy. I've mentioned that I think this is the scariest Scooby-Doo movie, and I think it would be hard to argue with me on that one. The zombies are just so well designed, they would have been enough on their own. Not that I'm complaining about the cat girls. The cat girls are legends and they did nothing wrong. Like, I should probably acknowledge that it's a little strange the Confederate zombies running around are actually on the gang's side in this scenario. I just pretend they're all tourists. On top of this being the most horrific Scooby-Doo movie, I think it's also got the best mystery. I mean, the plot thickens and thickens. Like, who opened a window? You can feel the chill in the air. Cut! Who opened a window? Play it again, Fred. Did I mention that this is Daphne at her best? It's supernatural. You are so corny. She both has a hilarious attitude and is well positioned within the gang as the one who wants to prove the existence of the supernatural. I love that she can't though, because as I said, I love the ending. In conclusion, I just think that Bow.